Hey everyone, Steven here, and today I'm reviewing the Samsung Odyssey Neo G7 monitor. Like all of my video reviews, I'll be covering these specs first before getting into what I like, don't like, the gray area, and then wrapping everything up. I'll have video of me unboxing the monitor rolling while I cover the specs, so let's get into it. The Samsung Odyssey Neo G7 is a 32-inch 4K 165Hz VA panel monitor with a 1000R curve, quantum mini LEDs, HDR1000, and has 1196 local dimming zones. The typical brightness is 350 nits, minimum brightness is 300 nits, and peak brightness is 1000 nits, which I tested this using VESA's Display HDR test, and it showed peak nits at 1015. This has a static contrast ratio of 1 million to 1, and a mega dynamic contrast ratio. This has a 1 millisecond gray to gray response time, AMD FreeSync Premium Pro, and covers 95% of the NTSC and DCI-P3 color gamuts. The VESA display test gave a little more info here also, showing this covers 99% of the sRGB color space, 90% of the Adobe, and confirms the 95% DCI-P3. For ports, you have 1 DP 1.4, 2 HDMI 2.1, 2, .1, 2 USB 3.0, and a headphone jack. Inside the box, you will find the power brick and adapter, a DP cable, USB hub cable, the VESA mounting bracket, which is for a 100mm by 100mm pattern, and the user manual. For mechanical adjustments, this has a height adjustment of 120mm. This can swivel 15 degrees to the left and the right. It can tilt 9 degrees forwards and 13 degrees back, and it can pivot 92 degrees to the left or right. This weighs 19 pounds with the stand and 14.8 pounds without. Last, you have the signature Odyssey lights, two on the front that still look like they should be speakers to me, and the ring on the back. This seems to be the same molding as the first G7 with the exception of the menu button which is located at the bottom middle of the panel and it's now a multi-button layout instead of the single button that you found with the original G7. Speaking of the menu, let's get into some of the settings here. For the menu design and layout, it's the same as the rest of the Odyssey lineup, and it's one of the ones I personally really like out of all the monitors that I've tested. I won't cover everything in the menu here, but I'll try to cover as much of the important stuff as I can. Opening the menu up, you have the game tab first, which has the refresh rate setting that you can change between 165 and 120 hertz. Under that is the response time, which you won't be able to change if you have adaptive sync turned on. With response time though, you have standard, faster, extreme, and extreme low motion blur. Extreme low motion blur won't be available if local dimming is turned on. With this having a one millisecond gray to gray response time, I expected this to have minimal ghosting or black trailing, and it does a good job with this with standard. You start to see a little bit with the fast if you are looking for it, and then it becomes more apparent with fastest. With extreme low motion blur, the monitor will become more dim and there is a slight amount of ghosting. After that, you can enable adaptive sync, and this is G-Sync compatible. I don't have a pursuit camera still, so I won't really be able to showcase how this looks in person in terms of the trailing and the ghosting here, but hopefully the video here gives you a small idea. Ultra wide game view is after that, which allows this to display in a 21 by 9 aspect ratio, but you will have black bars on the top and bottom of the panel if you do that. Next is low input lag, which I had enabled for all of the video in this review. Black equalizer is after that, and it's more important for this panel than previous Odyssey panels I've used, especially with HDR enabled. Last is the infinity core lighting, which you can adjust the front and back lighting separately or together. The lighting has static, which offers a large color palette to choose from and not just a couple colors. And then with the static enabled, you can also get the core sync, which mimics the lighting that you would actually find on your screen and then translates that over to the lights themselves. I'm assuming it's just picking zones on the monitor that it's actually taking that color from. You don't get to tweak that, so there's no adjustments to this that you can actually make. And from my experience, it doesn't work great in terms of the color replication that it does. 
It seems more like it's actually just mimicking the brightness levels that are on screen versus the actual color that it's seeing. After that, you have rainbow, flash, double flash, and breathing. The flash and double flash lighting effects to me seem a little bit odd. Um, I'm not sure how many people would actually use that, but it's there for anybody that does want to, I suppose. Next is the picture tab and the picture presets. Here you have custom, FPS, RTS, RPG, sports, sRGB, cinema, and dynamic contrast. With each of these, you can adjust the brightness, contrast, and sharpness. If you click on the color tab, it'll bring up the color tone, which you have custom, natural, cool one, cool two, normal, warm one, and warm two. For each of these settings, you can adjust the red, green, and blue colors. You can adjust the gamma also, which has three separate modes, and then you can adjust the saturation. Last in the picture tab, you can turn on the contrast enhancer, which automatically balances the contrast for you. You can adjust the black level for the HDMI inputs. You can adjust eye care. You can adjust the screen position or increase the picture quality, and you can get the calibration report. Next, you have the picture and picture tab, which allows you to turn this on or off and then make adjustments to the source. The on-screen display tab is next, which allows you to adjust the language and display time. And last is the system tab. Here you can adjust the local dimming to be off, auto, low, or high. After that, you can adjust the volume out, but keep in mind this doesn't actually have any built-in speakers with it. After that is the dynamic brightness, which can only be turned on if local dimming is turned off. And the last thing I want to mention you will find in the system tab is the ability to turn on or off variable refresh rate, which this monitor is G-Sync compatible for anybody wondering. So now that I've covered the specs and panel settings, let's get into what I like. Now I will say that I overhyped this monitor in my head and was expecting this to look incredible out of the box and honestly I was really let down with my first impression. After taking a moment to calm down and thinking through why this would be, I realized this monitor has so much going on with it that the spectrum of adjustments this offers is what's potentially going to make it such a good monitor. After adjusting the panel settings and NVIDIA control panel, which took some time and illustrated my point about the amount of adjustments that this has, I was able to nail down the look that I wanted. The presets here are good, but not 100% to my liking, so if you do buy this monitor, expect to sink some time into adjusting everything to get it where you want it to be. With all that being said, when I got this where I wanted it to be, the image quality since then has been incredible. Part of that for me has been the HDR, which is the best I've seen with any monitor I've used to date and is the star feature of this monitor. I typically only use HDR when I'm actually testing out a monitor and playing certain games. With this monitor though, I've actually kept HDR on and in fact most of the footage shown of me playing games in this review is with HDR. I've always said in my other reviews that HDR hasn't felt like it's where it needs to be for me to use it much, but this monitor is the first one that feels like it's what HDR is meant to be for PC gaming. The 1000 nits peak brightness paired with the 1196 local dimming zones compared to the 400 nits and 16 local dimming zones I've used with other monitors is very noticeable. I'll have video showcasing the local dimming around my cursor, and it's crazy to see the local dimming in action. So instead of a large zone that you would see with a monitor that has only, for instance, 16 local dimming zones, this is really just highlighted around whatever the object is. Because of the local dimming here, blacks are true black with no black light glow effect to them, and the whites can be tailored to be paper white or slightly off white depending on your preference with the ability to tweak how much glow this may or may not have. So zero black light bleed with this, which is incredible to see. Horizon Zero Dawn showcases this very well, and playing scenes at night showcase how the panel displays the darker and the lighter parts of the image without the visual panel glow behind the black areas and the local dimming working in action with wider areas. 
This is also noticeable in the daytime scenes where you can see how the true black affects the realism of the images. It may not come across as much in these videos, but in person, it's really cool to see. Again, this is all about the amount of customization this monitor can offer you in regards to the look you want to achieve. With this, the closest thing I've been able to come up with explaining how this feels in person in terms of a technological leap is the leap from 1440p to 4K. Now, 1080p to 1440p felt like a massive leap in my opinion. I remember the first time I saw it with The Witcher 3 on my BenQ monitor and it blew me away. The jump to 4K after that was noticeable, but it didn't feel as big of a leap as 1080p to 1440p did. Of course, if you went from 1080p to 4K, it would feel like a big leap also, but the jump from 1440p to 4K wasn't as big in my opinion, in the same way we don't see large leaps in tech with phones anymore. That's not to say that the advancements that this monitor makes is bad in any way, it's just not the same large leap. This feels like the next leap in tech in the same way 1440p to 4K was. Now, if you're coming from a 1440p monitor to this though, it'll feel like a slightly bigger improvement than going from 4K and 16 local dimming zones to this monitor. Real quick, some things to note here about the HDR. HDR has to be turned on in Windows for the local dimming to be noticeable, so make sure 10-bit color is enabled in your AMD or NVIDIA control panel, and you may need to tweak both the in-panel and the AMD or NVIDIA control panel settings to get this exactly where you want it. Don't expect it to look amazing without any adjustments. You'll need to let the monitor warm up for it to look exactly how you have it set after booting up if it's been idle for a while. I noticed it can take a couple of minutes for it to look exactly how I had my settings here. Whites lean a little more red until it's warmed up and are a little more dim. The monitor in general seems to lean a little red regardless of having HDR on also. If Windows turns HDR off, which mine did for some reason, the panel will look off. So that might be the first thing I would check if it isn't looking right, even when you haven't changed the panel settings. Going back to the good here, with or without HDR on though, this monitor in terms of the vibrancy it can achieve with color is top notch. I typically like my monitors slightly more saturated and the brightness turned up, but here the brightness, because of how high the nits can go, is turned down lower compared to other monitors I've used, and the color here is easy to oversaturate, so I've actually toned this down a little in the settings. The response time here isn't as noticeable as I was hoping it would be, but I can still tell it's faster than a 1 millisecond motion picture response time monitor. And the ghosting and the black trailing as a whole, depending on your settings, of course, are very minimal. For the overdrive setting, I've been using standard as it has the least amount of ghosting, but it still has a small amount, which other one millisecond greater gray response time monitors I've used in the past have been better than this one in that regard, but overall it still feels very responsive. I've heard the Neo G8 monitor, which has all the same specs as the Neo G7 here, except that it has a 240 hertz panel and HDR 2000, is actually having the same issues with flickering that the original G7 had for some people. So this monitor hasn't had any of those issues, so if you're concerned about that, don't worry, it plays very smooth. Next, this has been great when playing on the Xbox Series X. Still don't have a PS5, so couldn't try that out, but for the Xbox, it looks great. I don't know that I would buy this specifically for a next-gen console, but if you're planning on using this for a PC and next-gen console, this will work great for both. HDR content on the Xbox looks incredible, and the local dimming works just like it does on the PC with no visible blacklight bleed or glow. Next, the mechanical adjustments are great and something I would expect to have at this price point, but the thing I thought was a little more interesting here was using the portrait orientation. The 1000R curve here in portrait mode is something I didn't test with the original G7 when I reviewed that, but here I tried playing Doom Eternal while using OBS to see if this would be a potential option for streaming and my 3080 was struggling. The resolution ends up being non-standard, so trying to stream here would most likely be a disaster, but it was still fun to toy around with. Using this for editing content, scrolling websites, or writing would be more practical. It felt like a small taste of what the Samsung Arc would be like, which is a 55-inch 1000R curved 4K monitor that can actually display three different programs when in portrait mode. 
Next, the extra USB ports here are nice to have, but also something that I would expect from a monitor at this price. And last, the text clarity on this monitor has been really good, and I haven't noticed any text or image morphing towards the outer edge of the 1000R curve. So if you're a content creator and you need to be editing HDR content, whether that's video or photos, this might be a great option for you. Speaking of content, I don't typically watch 4K or HDR content on my computer. I really just game with it. But watching the new Avatar trailer with 4K HDR and the local dimming in action and then actually utilizing the Gobi DreamView Pro, this is the only portion of this where I actually videoed anything with this but it just creates this very immersive experience and it's just this next level thing. I really wish that I could actually showcase this to everybody in person because it's one of those things where you just have to see it in person to really appreciate it. Moving on, let's cover what I don't like about this monitor, starting with the wobble. This is the most wobble I have seen with any monitor to date. If your desk shifts even a little, this thing is going to wobble, which is a shame because the stain and molding all look great aesthetically, but for this price, there shouldn't be this much wobble in my opinion. Now you could mount this to eliminate that issue, but that's another investment you need to make if you didn't already have one, and the thought of needing to buy something else for a $1200 to $1400 monitor feels absurd. Now, if you have a pretty solid desk or plan on using a console so you, you won't really be typing much or actually using a mouse, you may not notice this wobble at all. If you type a lot, your desk shifts, or get over enthusiastic when gaming, then this is probably going to wobble. Even as I was typing the script for this review and actually editing the video itself, the monitor was wobbling a lot. Now, I don't think that this is a make or break issue here, but still, how has Samsung not figured out how to get this thing from wobbling so much? Now, all of the other monitors I've reviewed in the past have some level of wobble to them, but this is just different. This is a lot of wobble, and it's odd because this is the same mold as the rest of the Odyssey lineup that's been out for, well, almost three years now. Next are some things I would typically put in the gray area section of a review, but the price of the monitor has bumped them up. The first thing here is the lack of speakers, which most PC gamers use external speakers or headsets, but for console players, this would have been nice. Much cheaper 4K monitors have speakers, so my only thought here was Samsung was trying to cut down costs due to a higher cost of the panel. Next is the menu button, which Samsung has switched from the single button to a multi button here, and I don't know why. I don't know who asked for this because the single button really worked great. The new multi button just feels far less intuitive to use, and they're crammed really close together, so if you have bigger fingers, you will most likely press the wrong button often. Last, the local dimming here is incredible for gaming, don't get me wrong, but there are instances outside of gaming where you may want to adjust how it changes the look of whatever is on screen. This is very apparent when looking at websites, which can have text bright on one end and then darken as it goes towards a certain area. I've noticed websites that are white for the backdrop are bright when in a small window and then darken when expanded, which I thought would be the opposite of how it would look based on the screen area of white versus black. This is very hard to capture on camera, so I won't be able to showcase this unfortunately, especially the next one, which is a darker strip in the middle of the monitor I can notice when running the UFO test and when moving a white website or image from the left to the right hand side of the screen slowly. Now this particular thing I can actually notice regardless of local dimming turned on or off, and to me it looks like a consequence of the 1000R curved panel. Now I don't think these things are deal breakers and for some people you may not even notice them at all. My concern here for the local dimming specifically is something I've talked about with other HDR monitors which is constantly needing to turn on and off settings. It may be a nuance and off putting enough for some people to not like this monitor. Now this is the closest I've ever seen an HDR monitor be to a set it and forget it type situation as I mentioned earlier but here it does miss the mark a little bit in my opinion. I think that will be dependent upon the individual, but if you purchase this monitor, keep these things in mind. Now a potential way to minimize changing things all the time is tweaking the presets because they will remember the changes that you've made to them. Change these things to your liking for gaming and then leave HDR turned on via Windows so it's just one change versus multiple. For me personally, I just choose to ignore this. Don't get me wrong, it still annoys me, but changing things in the menu for me is just worse than letting this slide here. 
Last, let's cover the gray area stuff, which I usually say this is where I will cover things you may or may not care about, but this is going to be a big one here, and it's the price. This costs $1,300 normally. I got mine on sale for $1,100, and although this has some amazing performance with HDR because of the mini LEDs and the 1196 local dimming zones, the price here is going to be such a large determining factor for who will or will not buy this. Writing this review, I've just been thinking about all the comments I'll be getting on the video. That's way too expensive, no thank you. I got this monitor and love it. The HDR here isn't worth that type of money. Gaming is amazing on this thing. No thank you, I'll just wait a couple years and it'll be half the price, etc. The larger issue I find myself running into with this monitor is where it fits within the spectrum of PC gamers. The price of 4K monitors is slowly coming down and monitors with this many local dimming zones used to cost $2,500 to $3,000. So it's great to see the price coming down, but it's still a hefty price tag, so you wanna feel like you've made a good investment that will last you a couple of years. Some 4K monitors with high refresh rates are close to $600 now, down from $1,000 just a year ago. And for most people, that might be the better route. For those with deeper pockets that want to be towards the forefront of monitor tech, this could be a great option for you. For me personally, this is the most I've ever spent on a monitor, but for me it actually feels worth it. If you can wait a little while though, I imagine that this year we're going to see some really good Black Friday deals on these monitors. I'm targeting just PC players here because if you're just playing on console, this isn't worth it as you won't take full advantage of everything this has to offer, specifically when looking at the adjustments you can make in the NVIDIA or AMD control panel on top of the panel settings itself. So unless you just have a ton of money and want to try this out, you might want to look into something that is more cost effective for you and perhaps bigger like the Aorus FO48U or FV43U. This also has some missing features other monitors have at cheaper price points like a KVM switch and a USB Type-C input. These aren't must-haves necessarily, but most higher-end 4K gaming monitors have them these days. So in conclusion, this monitor has a lot of great things going for it and a premium price to reflect that. The HDR and local dimming zones here are top-notch and the best I've seen in any monitor to date. For enthusiasts and hardcore gamers, this might be a monitor worth looking into if you want to be on the cutting edge of monitor tech at the moment. Like all tech though, these moments tend to pass rather fast, so what's cutting edge today will be obsolete tomorrow. Now, not literally tomorrow, but I have a feeling that in a year's time, this monitor will be three to $600 cheaper, and there will be some new shiny monitors on the market. For some people, it'll be a waiting game here to get this at a more reasonable price, but if you're like me, I don't want to wait until then, and I want to enjoy this now, it'll be worth it because at the end of the day, it's about what you will enjoy and what you're willing to spend your money on. I'll have a link for this monitor in the description if you want to pick it up, and if you have any questions about this monitor, let me know in the comment section. Well, that's going to be it for this one, everybody. If you liked the video, hit the like button for me. If you want to continue to follow along with all my content, hit the subscribe button for me. And as always, thanks so much for watching. 